Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Yoram Weinweb, and with me is my colleague, uh, Ran Ziv. Uh, we're both from a company called Gigaspaces, who are the creator of Cloudify, a Tosca-based uh, orchestrator for um, the cloud. And basically, what we're going uh, to talk to you today about is about the uh, APIs, uh, how, to how to develop for the OpenStack API, and uh, primarily our experience as a uh, people who developed Orchestrator, who has extensive usage of OpenStack and put OpenStack into quite a bit of uh, uh, challenges from uh, the way that we use it and what we saw and things that we learned from it. <coughs> so in terms of the structure of, the, uh, of our, our session today, I'm going to start with a short introduction to OpenStack API and how to uh, basically from a user perspective, how to interact with OpenStack, uh, mainly programmatically, but uh, also in general. Um, later, we're going to go into how we use the APIs in Cloudify in our orchestrator and how we represent the functionality of the, uh, of the APIs and the resource, OpenStack resources in our uh, orchestrator. Then we're going to go into uh, some of the quirks and pitfalls with uh, OpenStack APIs that we experienced, and we want to share that uh, information with you and hopefully get you to avoid some of those uh, pitfalls. <coughs> and uh, lastly, we're going to talk about uh, testing your application in an OpenStack environment, challenges of different versions, different distributions, and so on. So basically, when we, uh, we're talking about uh, interaction with OpenStack, we're talking primarily on two things. One is sending commands and actions to OpenStack, basically doing operations that will make changes on your OpenStack environment. For example, booting a VM, creating a network, uh, deleting a, a router, uh, these sort of things that basically change the state of your uh, OpenStack uh, uh, Cloud. The, uh, the second thing is uh, collecting information. Uh, collecting information can be uh, get a uh, list of all the servers under a certain user, get a, a list of networks, check that you, the server that you just booted really started and is in active state, and so on. If we, if we look at uh, how uh, OpenStack uh, interaction uh, kind of look, we, we have at the core, we have the OpenStack endpoint RESTful API. Basically, for each uh, endpoint, if we're talking about Nova, Neutron, and so on, each endpoint uh, provides a RESTful API endpoint that uh, you can interact with and maintain it. Be uh, above that, you have the, uh, the different SDK, the different client libraries to work with, uh, with OpenStack. Primarily, the, uh, and the supported officially by OpenStack is the Python client uh, API libraries, set of API libraries. And uh, in addition to, uh, to that, you have SDKs for many other languages. You have uh, SDKs for C, C++, Erlang, Go, uh, uh, Microsoft.NET, Java, and m many, many other languages that uh, probably uh, haven't included here. Um, another both the, uh, the, S, the, the SDKs, really what they do is they, they provide a, an object model and the classes that uh, give the user an easy way to programmatically to basically send RESTful API calls and, uh, and get the information from the RESTful API calls, present them again in, uh, in objects and uh, program programmable uh, entities. Uh, then we have Horizon. Horizon basically doesn't go through the client libraries. It goes directly and talks to the REST uh, API of, uh, uh, of OpenStack. To whoever, whoever doesn't know, Horizon is the kind of the web front end of, uh, of OpenStack. And we have the OpenStack CLI tools. For each uh, client library, there is the CLI tool. And uh, uh, recently, there is also the OpenStack CLI tool that basically kind of provides you a more unified CLI to the most common um, uh, services in OpenStack. So when we look at the RESTful uh, API endpoint, we have uh, some things that we need to take into account and be aware of. First, there is the versioning. Uh, for each uh, endpoint, um, 
will support uh, versions. There will, there will be the version that currently is the version that is the current for the release, but it also will support uh, most likely uh, older versions. And that's very important when it comes to uh, upgrading your application that you develop versus upgrading OpenStack. Sometimes you may want to upgrade OpenStack and you don't want to start uh, be worried about each of my applications that I develop with OpenStack. Uh, how will that behave with, uh, uh, with the upgrade? So by specifying the version that you're going to work with, um, it's supposed to maintain the, uh, the same API contract uh, even when you upgraded to a new version. Next, there is the different interfaces the public internal ad admin. If you are writing an application, a user application that will start a VM or will create a network, do things that are from the user perspective, most likely you're gonna work with the public uh, interface of the, uh, of the API endpoint. There are two others, the, the internal and the admin. The internal are really what the, in, the internal components of OpenStack use when they uh, do uh, the operations. All the interaction inside OpenStack are done either through message queue or through going to the, uh, to the REST uh, API uh, endpoints. And you have the admin interface, which lets you uh, expose to more, uh, in some cases, to more uh, admin uh, set of uh, a super set of, uh, of uh, calls, uh, for example, that will that basically serve the admin of uh, OpenStack versus the normal user. And the interfaces sometimes will uh, uh, will be uh, separated uh, because you want to give different le uh, access levels, protect them with firewall. Perhaps the public one will be available outside the firewall. The uh, admin and internal may be uh, behind the firewall and will only be uh, exposed to uh, internal users that are running within the firewall boundaries. The last uh, point I want to make here is about format. Uh, currently the most common and actually the only one that is uh, going to be supported moving forward is the JSON format of uh, inside, the, the, uh, inside the HTTP calls. There used to be also an XML format and now it's uh, deprecated and in, in the newest releases it's even not available. So if you look at uh, some example of uh, endpoints and you basically you'll see uh, for each endpoint that you're familiar with you're going to see uh, the, that there, it has an API endpoint presentation and I listed here the current versions for each of the, uh, the different endpoints. So these are the core, like uh, identity keystone, uh, compute Nova, uh, image service glance, and so on. You have also partial list, that's not everything, but just a partial list give you an, a, an idea of some of the additional uh, projects and services that also uh, each of one of them will have their own API uh, endpoint. And by the way, in order to, um, to get all the API endpoints, you go to Keystone. Keystone, when you uh, authenticate with Keystone, you'll get back the list of all the, the different endpoints that are available, and uh, you'll be able to, uh, to start from that. You, you don't need to have a intimate knowledge of each one of the endpoints, which port it's, it's uh, on, and so on. <coughs> so when you were talking about debugging for a uh, when we're talking about developing for the API, there's also the uh, debugging and how to uh, check and feel how a certain uh, endpoint behaves and, uh, and do the operation that you want to later incorporate into your application uh, beforehand uh, from the CLI, later in a sample code, and then maybe uh, put it in your application and how to debug it. So you have the the CLI will give you the flag, like the minus minus debug flag, which will give you a lot of output of what the CLI did and which REST API calls it's actually triggered in order to do, for example, an OpenStack server list or a, or a Nova boot or whatever other uh, API uh, CLI call, uh, commands you're going to run. Um, the Python uh, SDK, once you, uh, once you write in Python your code, um, you'll, uh, you'll be able to add logging to, the, um, to your code so that 
you'll see exactly what each one of the uh, client library is doing the same way as you, uh, you you've seen from the CLI and you can match what the, how the behavior happened on the CLI versus how it happened in your application and maybe find differences or why things went wrong if they did. Then you have the uh, VM logs. Uh, once bo VM booted doesn't mean that it's accessible and that you can uh, uh, interact with it. By accessing the, VM, uh, the the VM logs either through Horizon or through the CLI, or actually also from the Python SDK, um, you are able to see how the boot process of the VM happened and find out if something went wrong, uh, wrong in the process. Um, in addition to that, sometimes the information coming back from uh, uh, the RESTful API calls will not give you enough data to understand what really went wrong when things went wrong. So in, in certain cases, you will want to also look at the back end of OpenStack to see how the services of OpenStack uh, behaved uh, and responded to your API call. In order to do that, uh, you want to get access to uh, OpenStack uh, service logs. If you're a user, sorry, if you're a user, sometimes you do not have access to, this, uh, uh, to those uh, APIs on your production or even on your test environment in your company. And therefore, I recommend also getting familiar with DevStack. It's kind of a, a small development size uh, OpenStack that has uh, the similar API, and you can see how, uh, how it responded to your application calls. So let's, uh, let's demo a little bit what, uh, uh, what I talked about. <coughs> so this is the, uh, the OpenStack uh, command line. And uh, this is the new OpenStack CLI tool. And I added the minus minus debug server list. I'm running here locally inside the Vagrant box, uh, running Linux. And inside Linux, there is a dev stack. And basically, what I do here, uh, all the, uh, the OpenStack credential and everything is in environment variables, so it's not explicitly stated. And when I hit the command, you can see here, let's scroll up. You can see there is quite a bit of information coming, uh, coming from the command line. And uh, I think the most important, you can see here uh, things like which version of the API was contacted, right, in, in this area, and which parameters were used. But I think maybe the most important piece here is this piece. And you'll see in, in certain cases, you'll see several of these. These are the actual RESTful API calls that were made from the, uh, from the Python client library and the, new, uh, the, uh, the CLI utilized. And the, basically, it translated it into a command line curl command that you can then copy and uh, basically paste it. Here, just, uh, if I just remove the minus i, which will skip the headers. And uh, actually, let's run it like this. So basically what I see here, I triggered the same command as was triggered by the CLI. This command here just went to, a, just did the get and gave the, a, did a get and you can see here uh, the response back coming from a OpenStack. You can, uh, um, you can also, Pretty formatted with one second. Okay, so here you can see the uh, all the information formatted a bit nicer. The JSON information that was responded back from the uh, API and uh, endpoint. Similarly, we can see it in, a, in the Python uh, code. So in the Python code here, what, uh, what you can see is that I'm basically just starting a, a Keystone client, authenticating, uh, providing the token to, uh, to the Nova client, and then before actually triggering the command of a server list that is down here, what I'm doing here is I'm basically adding the logging that will make sure that I get the information uh, similarly to what we've seen from the CLI. And that's uh, the logging.debug, 
in the level, and also the HTTP log debug true, which makes sure that it's gonna, uh, gonna log all the RESTful API calls and responses from them. So if I... Okay, so you see the same, uh, uh, the same uh, information as what the CLI has shown. Last I wanna show you here is from the command line, I can also check on a certain instance that I have, the, my instance called test. And basically what I'm trigger, I triggered here is a console log show command. And that show me all the, the, the information of the VM boot and I can see here, let's say, if it did not get an IP from a DHCP or something like other that might have caused the VM not to be uh, accessible. This is a, a you, you, can, you can also trigger the debugging with an environment variable. This is the uh, command line that uh, I, what we've done in the demo is using the OpenStack uh, CLI. This is the Nova. It's uh, with actually now included in the OpenStack, and you can see a console log that will get you the log that uh, we've just seen. <coughs> Last thing I wanted to show here is the, de the dev stack. When you start a dev stack, if you want to debug it, use this, uh, uh, this configuration in your uh, local RC uh, file so that when you start the dev stack, and dev stack is just git clone dev stack, you, run, uh, you configure the, the RC file, and you put there, in addition to the uh, credential, you put the, this, uh, piece, uh, this information, and that will log all the, stash, all the services information uh, to the log file. Run. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, in the next part of our presentation, we'll be going, uh, we'll be running over how we've exposed uh, the OpenStack APIs in our orchestrator. Um, so the examples we're going to come from Cloudify. But basically, the things that we'll be, we'll be talking about are relevant for any orchestrator, for that matter. Um, but because we are going to show some examples from Cloudify. Uh, yeah. Test. Okay. Should I repeat any, everything or like? Right, so I, I just mentioned that we're going to run through the, um, the way we've exposed the OpenStack APIs in Cloudify, and for that uh, I'm going to have to tell you just one slide about Cloudify. So basically what's Cloudify? Uh, it's an open source pure play orchestrator. Uh, what it lets you do is basically just uh, deploy, orchestrate, and manage Tosca-based uh, applications. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Tosca standard, um, it's an open standard which lets you describe your application topology. Um, its components and uh, life cycle events and relationships. And beyond the, the topology, it also lets you describe um, the workflows uh, that uh, can help you uh, manage your applications, uh, day one and day two operations like healing, scaling, monitoring, things like that. And basically, it's, uh, you write it in YAML, or uh, if you want, you can also use the Cloudify Composer, which is a nifty UI for where you can just um, like uh, drag and drop components and connect them to one another, and it auto generates the uh, Tosca blueprint for you. Um, and beyond that, Cloudify has a very modular architecture, uh, and that's going to be relevant later on because uh, basically the way we support OpenStack in Cloudify is we have an OpenStack plugin. Um, and uh, you can pretty much write a plugin for any environment or tool, and uh, you, you receive lots of them out of the box as well. Um, so yeah, so Cloudify, again, it uh, supports OpenStack uh, by means of the OpenStack plugin. And um, the plugin was designed with uh, some, like, the, uh, the things that we, we kept in mind when designing this is that we want the plugin to um, support any use case, not uh, actually impose any restrictions on the user um, whatever his use case is, um, and while doing so, also be simple and uh, offer um, ease of use and, uh, and like syntactic sugaring where possible and things like that. And it also has to be robust at dealing with uh, cloud errors because those are very common. And beyond that, um, the last thing we kept in mind was uh, to make as much abstraction as possible where um, 
you, you have like the ability to make things that are common to also other cloud environments. Um, so the way plugin exposes types is um, uh, resources, so, I'm sorry, uh, is through types. And what we did in, in the plugin is basically for each type you have like the more prominent um, parameters, um, the ones that are always being used, and those are like exposed explicitly by the plugin, and the rest are uh, also uh, available, but uh, only through direct override. And beyond that, sorry, beyond that you can also um, configure the OpenStack clients that are used to make these calls uh, against OpenStack. So we're just going to run through a really short example. Uh, here you can see how you would define a subnet um, in, for that matter. And um, basically you can see, um, for example, CIDR, that's like uh, a parameter which is required by OpenStack. And because of that, Cloudify also um, exposes it directly here. So you have to input it. On the other hand, what you don't see here, if, for example, is the IP protocol, which is also required by OpenStack. But Cloudify simply provides you with a sensible default, which is IP version 4, so you don't have to input it. DNS name servers, for example, that's something that's also, it's not required by OpenStack, but it's uh, very often configured. Uh, at least that's what we found, so we also expose it. But enable DHCP, for example, um, that's less common, so we didn't actually um, expose it. But then if you want to actually override it, that's an example of how you would do that. Um, yeah, This is another example for a server. Uh, basically, all I wanted to show here is that um, you've got like the image and flavor, uh, and they're passed by name. So in, in the OpenStack API, you, you're supposed to use like an ID. Um, and basically, just one of the things an orchestrator can do is just uh, do syntactic sugaring and uh, translate the name to an ID for you. Um, okay, some considerations that you want to keep in mind um, when like writing an orchestrator is for example, some server operations, uh, they take a while to finish. So we're talking both about like um, just, just the time it takes a VM to boot and like the cloud init startup. And then the, all the time, if you configure your server with a password, it needs to retrieve it from the metadata service. And the SSHD service needs to start up if you have to, like operations to run against it. And in general, an orchestrator should like have some mechanisms to support asynchronous operations. So. In the OpenStack plugin, we have some of them. Um, um, yep. um, beyond that, also the same is true for volumes. Um, they also, like when you create them, attach them, detach them. Uh, again, you need some sort of handling for async operations. And uh, beyond that, um, volumes, they often have like uh, a specific set of operations that, um, that, are, that are common if you want to, to make them usable, like formatting and creating a file system, mounting them. So. Um, in this case, the plugin also takes care of these sort of things out of the box. Um, something else you might w want to consider when uh, exposing uh, the OpenStack API in, in an orchestrator is um, in security groups, uh, you always have a default security group in OpenStack. And the default security group, um, it might not uh, be what the user wants to have on, on his VM, but it always gets attached unless explicitly um, mentioned otherwise. So uh, if a user, for example, or, um, like had other um, security groups that he wanted to connect to the, to the VM, the, the orchestrator might, must be aware of this at uh, creation time of the VM. So he doesn't actually create the VM and only later on connect the security groups uh, because then the VM will also have the default security group and that might not be acceptable. Maybe it's got like uh, rules that the user isn't interested in. One other thing uh, to keep in mind is that when you create a new security group, there's, uh, there's permissive egress rules by default. So it ba basically it lets out all IP version 4 and IP version 6 communication. And um, this might be something that the user doesn't expect because that's like the default of OpenStack. So what we did basically is just expose one uh, parameter, which uh, just by uh, having it, we think that uh, it, it like uh, pulls more attention by the, by the user to um, the fact that uh, these default rules exist. But we also uh, set it to false, like we deferred to OpenStack's better judgment on that one uh, and set the default to false. Um, last thing I want to show here is just uh, we've mentioned before that uh, you can also configure the parameters for um, uh, the OpenStack clients. Uh, that are used to make the calls against OpenStack. So this is an example of how you would do that. Again, it's just uh, basically just another way of uh, making sure that we don't prevent any 
uh, like make any restrictions on the user, uh, whatever his use case is. Next, we're going to go over um, some quirks and pitfalls in the OpenStack API. Um, basically, just you know, sometimes not all of the APIs are necessarily as intuitive as you would like them to be. Um, whether it's due to historic or legacy reasons or just random bugs, whether they're already declared as such or not. And uh, the orchestrator can definitely help with handling these sort of stuff. So just going to run through a bunch of them. So the first one I want to, to talk about is uh, basically a network in OpenStack can have more than a single subnet. And when you actually create a server report, you only like uh, actually have to define which network it's going to sit on, but not the subnet. The subnet is going to be chosen arbitrarily. So um, if you want to actually place a server on a specific subnet, one like th the way we, we do it is uh, create you create a port, and when you create a port beyond uh, sending over the network ID, you can also de define which subnet it's going to sit on by using the fixed IPs parameter, which might not be that intuitive. Once you have once you have that, you can also connect the server to the port, and then you have a server on a specific subnet. <coughs> Next. Um, Key pairs, uh, they're the only resource that's actually managed on a per user basis rather than a per tenant one. Um, and it can just lead to funny behavior sometimes. Uh, for example, um, like hit stack, uh, if it, you get like a hit stack on one tenant uh, which was created by one user, the other user might not be able to delete it actually because uh, if, the, uh, if the stack also includes like a key pair from, uh, which belongs to the first user, then the, f the second user won't be able to delete it because it doesn't get access. In general, it just breaks uh, isolation between tenants because an, an action on one tenant might affect the other. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, next, floating IPs uh, in OpenStack, they must first be allocated and then attached to a server report. However, there isn't actually any validation when you try to do that, that the IP isn't already attached somewhere. Right, so if you create a server, you create another one, you, you attach the IP to the first one, you try to attach it to the second one, the first one is just going to get disconnected. Um, and basically it just brings up race condition scenarios, another thing that like an orchestrator should keep in mind because uh, you know, if you check if an IP is already allocated and then you try to attach it, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to work because maybe it's already attached to another one in between the time that you checked and the time that you attached it. Onward. Uh, so the Nova API for adding a security group is actually, it's not thread safe. Um, so if you run like, if you try to connect two security groups at the same time to the same server, uh, sometimes only one of them will get connected and not necessarily both of them. Um, and like the way uh, we solved it in our orchestrator is basically just uh, verify after you add an, a security group that it uh, really got connected. Otherwise you try, you just retry it. Um, and the Neutron API for adding security group to, to a port is actually, it is thread safe. However, the API still isn't concurrency friendly because what happens is as opposed to the, uh, the server API for adding security group, here you don't actually only uh, mention the new security group that you want to add, but you also, you have to like um, declare all of the security groups. Uh, so if another client uh, connected a security group, uh, like a new one to the, to the VM, you also have to be aware of it when you um, create uh, your own security group. Another one um, is ICMP rules in security groups. So a security group rules, um, they're usually defined over a port or a range of ports, but ICMP rules don't have this sort of association to a port. Instead, what they have are types and codes, okay? Um, and basically, just like we wanted to create a simple um, I, like uh, rule to allow a ping, and which is ping's uh, type and code are zero, um, and like there's no actual normal API for it. Apparently, what happens is you're supposed to use the port range max and port range min um, parameters of a neutron security group, and uh, basically just translate it to code and type. So this is an example of how you would create a rule which allows uh, ping from anywhere. <laughs> Next one um, is about uh, adding. Uh, Right, uh, a security group to a server. So uh, back in the day, you used to have NovaNet. Um, and while you can have many security groups with the same name, if you want to actually add a, secu a NovaNet security group to a server, you can, only use, um, you can only do that by name and not by ID. So if you have multiple uh, security groups with the same name, uh, it's just going to be ambiguous and the API is going to fail. 
uh, the API call. So um, that's like both a problem in that sense and the problem for an orchestrator because suddenly like when you like the code for, for the server where you try to attach uh, a security group has to be aware whether this is a like a neutron security group and then it can do that by ID or rather uh, an, a Novanet security group. Next one um, is about uh, ports. Uh, so actually this bug uh, was already fixed, but um, up to the Kilo release, if uh, anyone's still using uh, Kilo or uh, before. So ports used to be, um, like if you created a port explicitly and then attach it to a VM and then ter like took the VM down, terminated it, the port would actually get deleted too. Uh, from an orchestrator point of view, that's just problematic because again, it breaks abstractions. Uh, one, uh, one resource's life cycle affects another, so the, the orchestrator must be aware of it. Um, but again, it got fixed in the killer release, um, so it shouldn't happen anymore. Only a port that you uh, create uh, implicitly by creating a server and connecting it to a network would get deleted when deleting the server. Um, next one is about uh, keystone roles. Um, they are assigned per tenant, um, but uh, when it comes to admin roles, Actually, if you set uh, any user as an admin on any tenant, it becomes immediately an admin on all tenants. So there's no like uh, an admin for a specific project. You're an admin uh, across all projects. And that's both problematic like security-wise and there, then there's also the matter of, um, we actually noticed that uh, if you try to list resources using an admin account on one tenant, you sometimes you, you'd be able to see resources from another tenant. And basically how we ran into this is just we had this test and we wanted it to be like an admin, it, like we ran into both of these issues because th we wanted uh, the user for the test to, to have an admin on one project and suddenly like at the cleanup stage, uh, it listed all resources across other tenants as well and deleted them too. So just something to be aware of. Okay, next section is about uh, how we test uh, our, both our OpenStack plugin and just in general against OpenStack APIs. So um, we separate our tests to three sections. There's like unit tests. Uh, for unit tests, you can use either like the standard uh, mock library if you're using Python or custom mocks, or there's also the Mimic project for those of you who are familiar with it. It's a, it's a rack space project. It um, basically lets you, it um, mimics some of the OpenStack services. Uh, so basically you get like a really good mocks out of the box. Uh, beyond that, you've got integration tests, uh, which test the plugins operation uh, against like a real OpenStack deployment, but like it only checks like a specific operation, for example, creating a server, right? Or, or like creating a security group. And then you'd have like system tests, which both check the plugin end to end. So whether it's like both creating a server, creating a security group and connecting them together. And also like we use the OpenStack plugin to simply run all like most of Cloudify's tests, end to end tests on the OpenStack environment. So this is just uh, some code sample from uh, like, this is for creating a volume. So I just want to show that uh, in this case you have like a bunch of uh, open, uh, uh, sorry, a bunch of Cloudify code, um, like before and after the create volume uh, call to this, using the Cinder client. So these sections are probably something you're going to be testing using um, unit, normal unit tests, right? And you can see that we, oh, sorry, sorry. So you can see that we actually um, inject the Cinder client using a decorator up top. So it's really easy to just mock it and make sure that um, the unit test doesn't ever communicate with any OpenStack um, deployment. And then like you'd have an integration test which actually checks this specific method, just including the call to the Cinder client. And again, uh, you, you'd, you'd then want to have like a system test which also tests this together with other um, OpenStack uh, resources creation and uh, orchestration. Okay, so regarding our test environments, um, so both, both of our integration tests and system tests, uh, they run in parallel over mul multiple OpenStack tenants. And that's, uh, the reasons for that is, first of all, it's, uh, it gives you pretty good isolation. It's really easy to clean up. Um, there's uh, something called OS Purge, which is a really nice tool. Basically just really easy to delete an entire environment of uh, like a tenant of OpenStack using it. Um, for those of you who haven't tried it, so maybe you're not aware of it, but 
uh, OpenStack actually um, imposes uh, really tough restrictions on the order where you can delete stuff. Like sometimes if you want to delete uh, like an interface from a router, it won't let you do that because there might be a floating IP somewhere that needs like the connection to the router, all kinds of uh, weird things like that. So OS Purge can help you do that. Um, in our case, the tenants are pre-existing. It just lets you be able to both, um, um, like you can actually set up an environment for multiple tests to run uh, serially. Uh, so then what you can do is actually take a resource snapshot before and after each test and clean up only the delta, the new resources created by a test. And uh, beyond that, tenant, like if you'd want to have the tests create and delete um, the tenant uh, on their own, like automatically, uh, they would require cleanup anyway. So there's not much benefit to that. You can't actually delete a tenant without first cleaning up its resources. Um, so moreover, on uh, testing environments, we actually took our tenants and spread them across multiple OpenStack deployments. The, the major reason for that is just simply cloud sometimes have problems. Um, there's like, you know, uh, VMs just starting in error state, connectivity issues, maintenance, a bunch of those, uh, the list goes on. So we just don't want to rely on a single environment. And beyond that, that's the, just a, a really quick and easy way to test against multiple OpenStack versions and distributions. Um, right, so one more thing about uh, cleaning up your environment when you're using, when you're running tests uh, like I described is um, keepers make an exception when cleaning up resources because again, they're per user and not per tenant. So the way we handled it is basically um, we have each test uh, clean up its own keepers as opposed to having like an infrastructure cleanup for, for, each, for like all of the resources. Uh, but then also like if a test uh, was stopped abruptly, so there they might be uh, additional leftover keepers on the, for the user on OpenStack. So we also have an independent process which runs when the tests are inactive and cleans up all these leftovers. Okay, actually, uh, for the last couple of slides, I'm going to give it back to Yoram. So, thanks. Thank you, Ron. <coughs> so, basically, uh, what, uh, what I wanted to show here, and very quickly, because we are getting close to the end of the session, is um, in order to do the version, the different version uh, test and the different distribution test, uh, we, uh, the, for the versions, there is a dev stack, which uh, I think is a, um, is a good tool to get you to a sense. It's not re replacing the need to have also an OpenStack environment, but it's very easy to do the developer testing on the, uh, on the dev stack and very easy to change versions on the dev stack. Uh, another tool that I recommend uh, looking at for, um, for changing distributions and even changing um, versions and distribution together is uh, Ravelo. Ravelo basically uh, allow you to create virtualization to on top of virtualization uh, with um, blueprints that kind of start an OpenStack environment in a matter of a couple of minutes. So, and you can choose which hypervisors uh, it's going to virtualize. So you can have a KVM, you can have other hypervisor if, you, if you, your OpenStack uh, deployment is running on different uh, hypervisor. You can have different versions and then, the, of course, different distributions uh, created in different blueprints and uh, use that for uh, easy testing. We use it a lot also for um, after the development process, if you, if you want to check with, uh, with different customer environments, try to mimic customer environment, this is a good be uh, option to create sandboxing of uh, the, uh, the OpenStack in a way that gives full control, full access, and yet uh, uh, very easy to start and, uh, and, uh, and stop quickly. So uh, that's, uh, that's the end of the, uh, what we wanted to deliver. Now we'll open the floor for questions. Any questions? Okay, so thank you very much.